Hey everybody, what is going on? Hexlex here. I got another Master Duel video for you. We're finally coming back to Infernoble Knight. Uh, I will admit I was a little bit intimidated to come back to this deck, uh, mostly because I knew there were a lot of things that I still didn't know about it. Uh, in fact, from the time that I really posted my last, uh, uh, like the combo guide, as well as the deck profile last season, uh, I, I already immediately had people telling me that there are actually other ways to combo with the deck that I didn't show off. Uh, namely in the last build, right, we were playing the Broken Bamboo Sword package of the Cursed Bamboo Sword and the regular uh, Broken Bamboo Sword. Uh, that way when we send the Cursed Sword off of the uh, Ice Hold, then we can guarantee to get an equipped spell card. But it turns out you don't actually need to do that in order to do a combo. You just don't get to do quite the same combo line that I showed off. Uh, I will say the combo lanes that I showed off last season are like the quote-unquote more flushed out lines, as in uh, those lines are a little bit longer, they use more resources, and as such require more resources in the deck, but they do end you on a more powerful end board. However, uh, in the research that I've done on this deck uh, between the time since uh, it came out and I posted those videos to about now, uh, I've noticed that by far, the builds without the Bamboo Sword are the ones that are not only seeing the most play, but are also seem to be having the most uh, amount of success as well. Uh, indeed, from what I recall, and maybe I just wasn't looking in the right places, but uh, from what I recall doing my research for uh, this particular build, I didn't see, like, any builds that were on the Bamboo Sword package. So, uh, I was a little bit intimidated to, like, I was like, oh, I gotta learn new combo lines. But it's really not that different from what I was doing before. And... Um, I even had a question on the Discord, which by the way, if you're ever interested in joining the Discord, uh, feel free to check that out. We got invite link in the description below. Um, I'm usually hanging out in there, chatting with folks um, fairly regularly, honestly. Um, and we also have free challenges that have free pricing uh, just for playing Master Duel with the Untapped Companion, which you can also download with my affiliate link below. Also free, also helps out the channel. Um, but anyway, uh, so there was somebody asking on the Discord recently... Um, a really good question that I often struggle with sometimes, especially with certain decks, right? Uh, which is, you know, how do you know how to combo beyond the kind of quote-unquote main combo line, right? Um, and they actually used Infernoble Knight as the example deck. So, um, one way that I really like to tackle uh, combos that seem uh, a little bit intimidating, especially if I have to freeform it or not follow a combo line, is to look for what I call quote-unquote checkpoints, right? Um, so, for example, with Infernoble Knight, the checkpoint that I look for is, okay, if I have Promethean Princess in the yard with Riccardetto and just, you know, something to bring back with it, right? Then I know I can sync for the Angelica, and then I know how to combo out from there. Not only do I know how to combo out from there, but I also know that the combo from there will get me the end board that I want. Um, because especially with a deck like Infernoble Knights, there's so many ways to start your combo line, right? Um, like ideally, it's Neo Space Connector and Aqua Dolphin, but it really could be, uh, because of the material requirements of Isold, literally any two warrior monsters. So, uh, again, it can seem a little bit intimidating, but... Um, yeah, again, I, I think the most, for me anyway, personally, uh, the most helpful way to think about it is to think of checkpoints, right? Um, and I'm trying to think of another example with this stack, right? Um, I know that, for example, it if I am going to summon out the Barone, right? I need to establish the Renaud as well. So sometimes I also kind of think about it in less in terms of, like, okay, I need to do this here, then this, then that, then this, and just kind of think to myself, like, okay, what do I need for my end board, right? Um, I need to have access to Renaud at some point. As I mentioned, I need to have Riccardetto and a target, ideally Augur, for it to bring back uh, in the graveyard. Uh, Turpin, you will need Turpin in the graveyard a lot of the time as well. So, uh, again, if you could just, like, keep in mind the resources that you know you will ultimately need, uh, you can usually just kind of, like, finagle your way there. Um... Infernoble Knight is definitely, the more I play it, the more I realize one of those decks were like, yeah, there are combo lines, but um, if you can kind of get the hang of, like, freeform comboing with a deck like this, uh, then the sky is the limit. That'll hugely open up 
um, the kind of plays you can make. Because also, uh, if you're following, like, freeform combo lines, it can be kind of tricky if you, like, for example, Turpin, right? Uh, with the Infernal Noble, Infer Noble Knight quote-unquote combo line, uh, you just bin the Turpin from the deck to the graveyard. But if you open it, you might be like, oh, crap, what do I do with this card if I open it? Um, but again, as long as you can get it into the graveyard, it could be with Aqua Dolphin, um, could be by, like, using it as a material, summoning it alongside Fire Flint Lady, and then going for your Ice Old. You know, there's, like, tons of different ways that you could do it. So, um, just, like, I guess being open to, like, knowing what you need, but being open to, like, not having to strict, uh, strictly adhere to the combo line uh, is what's going to help you with not only this deck, but also, like, combo decks in general, right? Um, as far as the new combo lines go, by the way, or I guess quote-unquote new combo line, um, basically comboing without, uh, you know, the bamboo sword and such. I'll definitely show off that line here uh, in one of our upcoming games. But again, a lot of it is, like, pretty similar to um, the kind of thing that I was uh, already doing before. So, as far as the build itself goes, as you can see, we trimmed down from 46 to 42, which I really, really like. Uh, I do still want to be above 40 cards because we do still have our uh, suite of equip spells that uh, we're not really looking to draw. I mean, Durandell, it, it's actually not terrible to open this, but otherwise we're really not looking to open any of these equip spells. So I think being over 40 is correct. Uh, again, with two other equip spells in the deck that we weren't trying to open, uh, then I bumped it up to like 46. But again, without those, we're able to trim down to 42. Um, let's see here. I mean, otherwise, this build is like pretty much everything you would expect to see going on in, in for a Noble Knight deck. Uh, Nib and two Imperm, those are kind of the only things I'm a little bit questioning. Mostly the Imperms over the Nib, right? Um, you know, to be fair, for these more long-form combo decks, especially in a best-of-one format, um, you don't always see them playing stuff like the Nibir and the Imperms. Um, I've seen a lot of people on, like, Triple Tax or, um, just more gas. Like, I think a lot of builds, again, especially for best-of-one, uh, in Master Duel, are really more focused on, like, putting as much gas into the combo line as possible, which I can definitely see, right? Um, especially because if you don't open the Neospace Connector, you are looking at a two-card combo line just to get two Warriors on the field to start your plays. And in that regard, I can definitely tell you from experience, like playing decks, like especially Sprite Synchro, um, that being reliant on two-card combos is a lot more dicey uh, than relying on one-card combos, especially if you're trying to play, you know, non-engine disruption like this, right? The more reliant as a deck you are on two-card combos, I think the more gas in general you want to be playing. So, you know, I could definitely see a world where it's not right to play Imperm or these nibs. Uh, I ultimately elected to, or one nib, rather, I'm only playing one nib. I ultimately elected to play them. I could see myself cutting the Imperms for, like, triple tax. Uh, the nib, I don't know, I have just, nib is really good in this format, and I've always thought that if you're gonna play Maxi, you should probably just be playing a Nibiru. There's, like, very little reason not to, um, because, you know, if your opponent takes the Maxi challenge and you don't have nib, um, like, what are you going to do? Ash Blossom them? And, like, if you have monsters on the field, it's not like you can use the Imperm or anything. But I suppose if I wasn't playing Nib or Imperm, I mean, that was, like, one of the main things, thinking about Maxi and thinking, like, okay, if I resolve a Maxi and they just go, I don't have anything to stop them from not playing Nib and or Imperms, right? Then, then they just can, can, can combo off. And maybe that's preparing for a situation that isn't going to come up super often, but I still thought it was important to think about. Uh, for the extra deck, I like it a lot. Uh, I used pretty much everything in here, uh, except for the Appaloosa, um, but I can still see worlds where I go for it. You don't need second Synchro Charles or second Link Charles. You can definitely get away with only one of each, but I thought for grinding... Well, here's the thing I was thinking about the extra deck. I like having two of each for grind games, um, but also, I think with that mentality, I would also want a second Angelica for grind games. I can maybe see myself cutting the Appaloosa for it, but maybe Nightmare... Uh, not even Nightmare Unicorn, because that helps go into Axis Code, which does come up. So, like, I don't even know what I would really take out for a second Angelica here, though. Hita is, like, probably, honestly, the next best candidate. Because um, that really only helps in this deck go into, like, Nightmare Unicorn Axis Code. I guess, yeah, you could go into Promethean Princess, too, which can come up occasionally. But, well, I was going to say you would need to be in a situation where... You can heat up for an extender and go for Promethean Prince and still make up the combo line, which if you get Ash, I guess would happen sometimes. So, I don't know, it's tricky. Like, the second Angelica is also, like, not necessary at all, so that's why she's not in here right now. Um, but again, if I have a second of each Synchro and Leak Charles, maybe the second Angelica makes a little more sense then. Um, but you definitely can get away with only one of each. You do not need two of each. Um, 
Okay, let's see. I think that covers pretty much everything I have to say about this build. Yeah, I can't wait to give anything else off the top of my head. So let's go ahead and break it down card by card, and then we'll look at some games. Uh, we're playing one Infra Noble Knight Renaud, um, one Fire Flint Lady, one Infra Noble Knight Ricardetto, three Maxi, one Neo Space Sheen Aqua Dolphin, three Ash Blossom and Joy Spring, three Neo Space Connector, one Infra Noble Knight Augier, one Infra Noble Knight Oliver, one Infra Noble Knight Magus, one Infra Noble Knight Turpin, one Diabell Star the Black Witch, one Immortal Phoenix Gearfried, one Nibiru the Primal Being, one Reinforcement of the Army, three Heritage of the Chalice, one Original Sinful Spoils Snake Eye, one Living Fossil, two Infra Noble Arms Durandale, one Infra Noble Arms Joyous, one Infra Noble Arms Almace, one Angelica's Angelic Ring, three Noble Arms Museum, two Called by the Grave, one Cross Eye Designator, three Wanted Seeker of Sinful Spoils, and two Infinite Permanents. So that's going to be our 42 card main deck. For the extra deck, we're on one Infra Noble Knight Captain Roland, one Angelica Princess of Noble Arms, two Infra Noble Knight Emperor Charles, one Baron de Fleur, two Emperor Charles the Great, uh, two I Sold Tales of the Noble Knights, one Hita the Fire Charmer Blaze, one Ferocious Flame Swordsman, one Nightmare Unicorn, one Promethean Princess Bestower of Flames, one Appaloosa Bow of the Goddess, and then finally one Axis Code Talker. So that's going to do it for our list. Let's take a look at these duels. Okay, so uh, our first game, because now I'm actually finally going through Dual Scope replays before the video uh, and, and seeing what we're up against, uh, you know, what I should have been doing you know, for all these three years. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to be going first against Tier Limit here. Uh, this is showing off a full combo line. Now, this does not look like the kind of hand that would be able to produce a full combo line. Uh, but it is. Uh, normally, and ideally, you are looking to open with a Neo Space Connector. This is not only a one-card combo, but with the Aqua Dolphin that you summon, uh, you actually can use this card to gain advantage uh, of knowledge and looking at it in your opponent's hand. Even if you don't rip a card from their hand, you still know at least what's going on. Even better if you can do that while opening Dia Bellstar, because then that means you have more monsters to discard, uh, because it's based on the attack of monsters on your field. Uh, here we have no Neo Space Connector, but we do still have the ability to full combo with a hand like this. I'm going to start by using Diabelle to pitch the Living Fossil and activating her effect in order to set the original Sin, right? Now I'm going to flip that up and sending her in order to grab Riccardetto. The reason that I grabbed Riccardetto is because I know that I'm going to need Renaud in order to uh, Synchro Summon later at the end of the combo line. And Riccardetto, I just need to get him into the graveyard at some point, right? So now I can special the Fire Flint Lady from my hand. And from that, I can use them both to Link Summon into Isold Tales of the Two Noble Knights. So uh, we'll use her to just add another Neo Space Connector. I'm not like super worried about what I add here. Um, to be fair, I probably could have added something better, but it's like not anything too much better. So, okay, I want to talk about that real quick, that part of the combo line. So, normally, if you didn't open, like, Diabelle stuff like I did, uh, you would summon out the Augier from deck, right? Uh, like I did here. Here I sent Turpin, but again, if you didn't open a way to get Ricardetto into the graveyard, you would use Augier here to send the Ricardetto, because now we're going to use the Princess to bring back Ricardetto, and now Ricardetto is going to bring back the Augier. And this is what I was talking about earlier in the profile when I said, uh, if you're not sure how to follow or like... Um, if you're not sure if your hand can follow a specific combo line, just try to go for a checkpoint. And again, I knew as long as I can get this point of Promethean Princess, bring back the Ricardetto to bring back a level 4, like Augier, then I can full combo out. So we're going to do that from here. Uh, we're going to use these two in order to make Angelica, the Princess of Noble Arms. Okay, now I'm going to use the Angelica effect to add Noble Arms Museum and activate Noble Arms Museum. We're going to use the first effect, paying 12, to add another copy of Durandal from deck to hand. Uh, Augier is going to activate targeting the Angelica to try to equip. We can chain the Angelica effect in response, uh, sending... Okay, so normally, again... If I didn't already have the advantage of sending Ricardetto earlier, then then I would send Turpin off the Angelica and not the Immortal Phoenix Gearfried. You do have to have the Turpin in the graveyard. Um, but again, I was able to send it earlier off of Augier because I didn't have to send Ricardetto off of Augier. But just I want to make that clear to everyone um, that you know normally I would be sending Turpin here. I'm only sending Immortal Phoenix Gearfried because I already was able to put Turpin in the graveyard earlier. I'm actually not even going to use the Immortal Phoenix Gearfried for this combo line. I'll talk why in a second here. 
Uh, anyway, I'm going to equip... Okay, so you want to... This is very important. You want to equip the Durandale and then activate Turpin, because Turpin can special summon itself, but only if you have an equip card. Now, Turpin has another effect in the graveyard to equip itself, so make sure that you're not activating that effect. Make sure you're activating the second effect, and you have to have an equip spell in play in order to do that. Um, so we're just going to equip the... Um, Promethean Princess with the Durandel, so that way we can not only summon the Turpin from the graveyard, but after we summon the Turpin, then we're going to search the Renaud. And make sure you're searching the Renaud after you summon the Turpin, because obviously Durandel destroys itself after you search. Okay, now we're going to sync the Captain Roland with the Turpin in order to summon out the Infer Noble Knight Emperor Charles, the secret one, right? We can equip Captain Roland to Charles. We're then going to link off the now equipped Charles for our Link 1 Emperor Charles the Great. Uh, Charles is going to equip the Secret Charles from the deck, and we want to use Link Charles' effect, well, Link Charles copying Secret Charles' effect to blow up our own Promethean Princess. Uh, that looks really weird, right? That looks really weird to destroy our own monster, but uh, we not only need to summon a non-fire monster and Promethean Princess is locked into fires, but uh, we also need Promethean Princess in the graveyard to use her as a disruption, so... Uh, now we can special summon the Renaud. Uh, I can use Renaud to bring back an equip spell. I'll get Joyous here. And we can sync the Renaud and the Emperor Charles for our Baron de Fleur. After that, you're going to want to equip your Link Charles with whatever equip spell you added back. And now we're ready to go to end phase. One thing I will say here in particular is that um, I could have potentially used Joyous's effect to bring back the Immortal Phoenix Gearfreed from my graveyard and then summon it to the field. But the reason that I didn't do that is because then I wouldn't have anything equipped to Emperor Charles the Great. And then if I tried to use the effect during the end phase, I can't equip and I can't equip Angelica's Angelic Ring. So if I had another equip spell to put on Emperor Charles. Well, actually, couldn't I have. No, I don't think I had any monsters left in my graveyard that could equip themselves. No, because Turpin isn't in the graveyard anymore. I got banished. That's the other thing. If Turpin was still in the graveyard, I could have equipped Turpin from the graveyard to. Charles, and, and then, yeah, sack the joyous for the gear freed, but now we're going to keep it equipped, so that way, again, Emperor Charles can equip the Angelica's Angelic Ring from the graveyard, because Angelica's Angelic Ring can only be put on a monster that's already equipped with an equip card. That's why it's important to keep the Charles equipped here, but uh, this might not look like much, especially compared to our last combo line, where we ended on, like, two Link 1 Charles and also the Immortal Phoenix gear freed, but... In exchange for being able to reduce the number of cards in your deck and also improve its consistency uh, as a result, uh, and also have more room for stuff like Nibiru and Imperm if you want that disruption, uh, we're still ending on, again, this might not look, look like much, but it's actually, uh, I think, five. Yeah, five disruptions, right? Uh, we need the first spell that resolves with Angelic is Angelic Ring. This negates any spell or trap card. This is an Omni Negate. Uh, we have in our graveyard the Promethean Princess, which will pop a monster that's special summoned. We also have Infra Noble Knight Captain Roland, which can equip as a quick effect, which will proc the Synchro Charles effect to destroy a card in the field. So we have one destruction of any card at any time, one destruction of a monster when it's special summoned, one spell negate, one spell or trap negate, and one Omni negate. Uh, so five points of disruptions, which is eh, not too bad if I do say so myself. Uh, opponent is going to activate the Pearl Mino here. I decided to let the Angelica's Angelic Ring get it, but looking back, that might have ended up being a misplay. I think I actually should have negated this with the Link 1 Charles, because if I thought it was Tier Limit, they could very easily Super Poly, which, fun fact, uh, Angelica's Angelic Ring uh, can actually negate that. Uh, this also only negates the first spell card that resolves, so I believe if you do negate it with something else, it, it will actually uh, negate the next thing instead. Um... But yeah, as we demonstrated, we actually demonstrated that in our last deck profile, so if you want to see exactly how that works, go check out that video, where we do use Angelica's Angelic Ring to negate a Super Poly. Uh, opponent's going to use regular Polymerization. If they're on tier, I definitely want to be negating that. They get to have this when I negate it. That's fine. I don't really care. They didn't really mail anything very relevant anyway, so... Uh, going to use the Magus to shuffle back Turpin from the Banish, as well as Durandel and Ricardetto from the de or Graveyard into the deck, drawing, you know, Maxi, because I'm the best player ever. Pluto's actually going to draw two cards here, or try to, triple attack. Uh, we're definitely going to throw out the Ash Blossom against that. Still have the Baron and the Roland, by the way, so we still have two of our original five negates here. Pluto's going to activate Shiren. Uh, we're definitely going to chain Maxi in response to that. Um, and now yeah, we'll just see what they end up milling here. 
Uh, they did Mila Shiren, also a Rhino Heart, but no cards in hand, thankfully. Uh, I'm just going to negate the fusing effect of Shiren with the Barrel and Diffler here. If it gets a Trivikarma, that's fine. I, I definitely don't care at all. Uh, they already have Hadmus on the field, so even if they had another... Um, what was that spell card called? Grief? That wouldn't really do much here. And yeah, they're just going to concede after that, so... They're under Max C, they're like, not really able to proc their Havnus, so they're out of fusions anyway. Um, it's like, what are they going to do? Link into Dark, I guess, or something? And like, I don't know. I don't even know what you could do in that situation. So, uh, there we go. That is a, that's a pretty standard, like, ideal Infra Noble game if you guys go first, right? And again, we didn't open the Neospace Connector, so we didn't open the, like, clean one-card combo line. Um, but we were still able to pull off the combo all the same, and hopefully... Hopefully this game and just the demonstrations here uh, can kind of give you an idea of how to combo with this deck in a little bit more of a sort of freeform style uh, without necessarily having to follow any super specific lines there. So, okay, there is our first game. Let's go ahead and see the next one. Okay, so as I usually like to do um, with more long-form combo decks, now that I've shown you what we can do going first uh, and going, you know, uninterrupted, uh, let's take a look at a going second game and see something a little more regular. We're playing against Branded Despia, by the way. Uh, so definitely glad to see that Ash Blossom in the opening hand. This hand, again, looks a little weird, but it definitely does have plays. Um, I mean, really, the access to DML plus, like, any warrior monster is going to be plays right there, so... A lot of options here. Opponent is going for a slightly more traditional branded Despia build, still playing the Fright for Patchwork Edge Imp package, which isn't terrible by any means. Uh, it's just not something you see quite as often these days. Looks like we're fusing the Edge Imp chain uh, and the. Uh, another tragedy in hand, actually, rather. Wow, into the Masquerade. Also, not a card you see as often nowadays. Anyway, I'm just really patiently holding this Ash Blossom for exactly Brand Diffusion, which here it is. Uh, also, one thing in particular that I really like to do uh, against Branded is, and, and I'm sure this is like, I know some people out there will be like, duh, of course you would do this, but I don't know. Again, I don't know how everybody thinks, so I figured I'd just share my thought process. If I'm playing against Branded Espia and I have Ash Blossom in my hand, not only am I saving it for Brand Diffusion, I'm definitely toggling off every time I would be able to activate the Ash Blossom because if they're, because the branded players will often try to bait out the Ash, or at the very least check to see if you've got it. Uh, I think that's what the Fight for Patchwork was, and of course the Alibur summoned before. I mean, to be fair, they needed to search out the branded fusion that way, but I'm, I'm pretty sure the Fight for Patchwork, in addition to making Masquerade, was mostly there to check to see if I had the Ash Blossom, because sometimes... They won't even try to bait you out, but they'll just see if priority gets passed over to you. And if priority only got passed over to me when they activated Fright for Patchwork, that's pretty obviously telling them that I have Ash Blossom. So by toggling off until I know the Brand Diffusion is about to drop, uh, we can catch them at least a little bit more off guard. Uh, and, you know, it might prevent them from, like, trying to play around it or something, right? Like, who knows? Maybe they could have, like, hard pivoted to search for the Brand and Lost and still somehow set up Brand Diffusion. You never know. So... Uh, obviously, this Masquerade is going to be an issue if I'm trying to do my combo line because we play like a million cards in this deck, <laughs> uh, like per turn. So, uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to summon out the Diabell, activate her effect to set the original sin, and then I'm actually going to move to battle and smack into my opponent's Masquerade. This is something that I've talked about a little bit that I don't see other people talk about nearly as much, and that's using your battle phase as a resource. Uh, I see a lot of people who are super fixated on um, using the battle phase to end the duel every single time they are able to, right? Um, or if they even have a chance that, that they are able to. I think a lot of people would have played into that Masquerade until they had a bigger board and then tried to battle. But I think that if your opponent has something like a Masquerade or an Appaloosa, or just something that's going to make your life harder, but is like kind of easy to run over with something like Diabelle. I think it's fine to use your battle phase to get rid of that monster, go to main phase 2. Yeah, you won't win this turn, but you can set yourself up in a situation where you're probably just going to win no matter what, which is what I'm doing here, right? Uh, I know my opponent has already used Brand Diffusion, they don't have a way right now to be able to recycle it. So, I know they're going to have a more difficult time, especially if they're on a um, kind of more, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Not traditional, but I guess an older build, a brand of Despia that's using the, like, Fright Furs and stuff, you know? I know it's going to be harder for them to play through the board that I'm going to make here. Um, and, yeah, I mean, at this rate, I'm just going to go ahead and set up that, like, turn one end board again, right? Um, again, I, there's a lot of the time where I actually like to try to punch through something like Max C if I've got the first attack and just try to find lethal anyway. 
But with Masquerade or something like Appalooza, it's a little bit different, right? Because when taking a maxi challenge, there's the threat that they could draw Nibiru if they're even playing it, right? Uh, oh, here they are going to have a DD Crow, which threatens to, like, screw up my combo line here. They actually used it at a really, really good choke point, but I had a combo line, so it didn't matter. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, it's like, um... Yeah, I'm more willing to play through a maxi because that doesn't necessarily represent immediate disruption. They might draw a Nibiru if they play it, but there's a lot of games where you really like, can't afford to like pass on turn two back into your opponent's turn three, so you have to go for it anyway. But this is the kind of situation here uh, where I find myself, you know, again, fine using my battle phase to get over the masquerade because again, I can't combo under that masquerade. I will, you know, lose all of my life points if I do that. So. But yeah, I mean, literally. We're literally just doing the turn one combo line at this point, so. And if you think about it, in a lot of ways, this is even better than doing this on turn one. Because my opponent's only going to have three cards in hand going into this board, as opposed to the six they would normally. I know one of them is a fright for a patchwork, so I'm not concerned about that. Which, actually, now that I think about it, I think... Oh, here, yeah, I'm not able to make the Baron, though, because I got firelocked by... I don't even know what, honestly. <laughs> some some card at some point firelocked me. That is going to be a little bit different, so I'm not ending on the Baron. But again, uh, you know, it's like, whatever. Uh, here, I actually misplayed again, because I'm also I'm playing against another deck that does use Super Poly. 100% should have negated that with Infernal Knight Emperor Charles. Uh, and then if tried to catch a Super Poly on the follow-up with Angelica's Angelic Ring. Thankfully, yet again, they didn't have it here. But I think that is important to keep in mind for especially fusion-based decks like Despia and Tyrowman. Um if, if at all possible, I think it is actually better to negate their first spell card with Charles. So that way Angelica's Angelic Ring is more likely to catch the Super Poly. I don't even know how many people are aware of the fact that, you know, they can play Super Poly, or they can't play Super Poly uh, through the Angelica's Angelic Ring, but, um, you know, it's better to assume that your opponent knows what's up than assume that they're going to make a misplay, right? But yeah, uh, here, as you can see, we're just able to use the Promethean Princess and the Angelica's Angelic Ring, and that was enough to secure the game. As I said, uh, you don't always need to take the attack of the first opportunity or to use your first battle phase to go for a lethal. Uh, sometimes I like using it, as we saw here, as I talked about, to just remove an obstacle that's stopping me from comboing, uh, and then just win on my next turn, or when my opponent concedes on theirs. Whatever. Their choice. So, uh, we have a couple more games to watch. Let's take a look at the next one. All right, taking the first turn against Mathmec for this game. Uh, I believe we are going first here. Uh, but this game, despite us going first, will still present a bit of a unique obstacle here. Ah, yeah, we even have the uh, the Neo Space Connector. So I'm going to draw Phase Wanted. Opponent's actually going to use the Ash Blossom on it. Don't do that. That's a mistake. Uh, don't ever Ash Blossom Wanted. I wouldn't even Ash Blossom Original Sin most of the time, honestly. Um, I would just assume it's Snake Eye and wait for the Snake Eye Ash. But anyway, going to normal some of the Neo Space Connector. Activate Aqua Dolphin Effect and... All right, so here's their hand. It's Circular, Circular, Triple Tag, and also Nibiru. So the Nibiru presents a little bit of an issue, obviously. Uh, the rest of the cards are, like, fine, whatever. Two Circular is, like... That actually does matter for a reason we'll see on our opponent's turn that they open two of this card. But, um... Yeah, so that's a little awkward. We also have to keep the Triple Tag in mind as well. I'll take... No, I'm not taking anything, because I don't have attack points high enough to... Uh, do keep that in mind about Aqua Dolphin. In order to actually discard a card, you have to have a monster with equal to or higher attack. Which oftentimes won't happen, but I think even the information is, like, good enough, right? So, uh, I'll just go into the ice. I'm just gonna start doing my combo line like I normally would here, despite the fact that my opponent has a Nibiru. Because here's the thing, right? I'm in a little bit of a tricky situation with this. So, I do have the Immortal Phoenix Gear Freed in my hand, which is pretty good. The problem with it is, in order to actually negate a monster effect, I need to send an equip card that is on the field that I control to the graveyard. Now, okay, Neospace Connector was summoned one, Aqua Dolphin was summoned two, Isol was summoned three, um, and then Augier was summoned four, which would make Immortal Phoenix Gearfried summon five. Here's where things get really awkward, right? So, what I could, in theory, have done is. 
banished living fossil from my yard, summon a mortal phoenix gear freed as my fifth summon, then equip the Magus from my graveyard to the gear freed. Not Augier, because I, I, I kind of need it. Well, I guess I don't need Augier specifically. Just equipped one of them, right? Equipped one of them to mortal phoenix gear freed, which would give me a monster negate. The problem with this is that if I do that, again, Phoenix Gear Freed is the fifth summon, so my opponent can still nib in response to that summon before I have a chance to put an equip card on the field, thereby giving me the ability to negate with Phoenix Gear Freed. I could have equipped to another one of my monsters. The problem with doing that, though, is that once that monster is sent to the graveyard as a material for a summon, I don't have an equip card on the field, and I can't negate Nibiru anymore. So I'm in a situation here where I think what I'm going to end up doing is just trying to do my combo line um and seeing how far i can get before yeah they nimby because if they'd wait until i had an equip card in the field then i could have summoned gear freed been nib proof and done my combo line but i'm wanting to wait here just to summon the gear freed and have a negate up uh, as well as the imperm as well so you know basically now instead of only having imperm going into the opponent's turn and throwing away my gear freed for nothing i get to have two negates as well as another solid body going into their turn right so all right, draw standby main. Opponent's going to lead with, of course, circular. So we know three of the four cards in their hand. It's two circular and a triple attack. Um, despite that, I am actually going to use the Immortal Phoenix Gear Freed effect here on the circular. Uh, looking back, that was definitely a misplay. I, I guess I will say this too. <laughs> when I watch this, uh, when I played this duel initially, normally whenever I reveal cards from my opponent's hand, I always write them down in a little notebook I keep like next to me on my desk. I didn't do that here, and I did actually end up forgetting that they had the Triple Tactics talent. So, uh, if you're playing effects that reveal your opponent's hand, I highly recommend writing them down, taking a screenshot. Um, you can't do that in paper play. That note-taking is not legal in paper play, but it is legal in Master Duel. So, definitely do it. <laughs> um, it it's definitely very helpful. Um, anyway, they're going to add an equation. It makes sense because they're on turn two for the uh, follow-up. I do also have the Promethean Princess in my yard. I was just really worried about them using the triple attack to steal my Phoenix Gear Freed here. So I'm going to use the Imperm on the Allen Burst and, and again, just hope they don't take the Gear Freed uh, and wait to see if I can do the Promethean Princess here. Uh, here's the triple attack, but they actually looked at my hand instead, and I think I know why they did. That probably sounds really weird, like, wait, why did they hand drip you there? It's because, again, during the actual game, I was still getting past priority, and I don't think my opponent realized that it was Promethean Princess. Um, I think they thought I had another disruption in my hand, and that they could triple attack and eat it. Maybe they were worried that I had a Nibiru as well. That's definitely a valid concern for my opponent at this point. But uh, no, it was my Promethean Princess that was giving me past priority here. So yeah, as soon as they link into the Splash Mage, that's the, that's the easiest Princess I've ever seen in my life. We're definitely going to eat those here. And then my opponent does something really funny here. Uh, they switched it to defense mode and then immediately can see, <laughs> which is funny because like, you know, I was thinking to myself before they did that, like, okay, so they'll battle nib over the princess. I can battle nib over its, with its own token, but then from there, it's going to kind of be a top deck war. Um, but then my opponent switched nib to defense mode and there was a bit of a pause between them doing that and conceding. And as soon as they did that, I was like, oh wait, no, I just win now. <laughs> like this, I easy just win now. Um, yeah, so... It's funny how like one one simple action of like switching a battle position turns a game from a top deck war to just a secured victory for one side. But uh, yeah, again, just wanted to show off a little bit of irregular play on turn one here. We have one more duel to see. Let's take a look at that. All right, our final opponent is gonna be on Vanquish Soul, and we are going second again for this duel. Definitely not a position you want to be in, going second against this deck. I, uh, it's been a minute since I've played against Vanquish Soul, but this deck is really, really good and really scary to play against. This hand's a little weird, but we can potentially make plays with it. Actually, not even that, not, uh, I was gonna say kind of difficultly, but it's not even gonna be that difficult. Anyway, they're gonna use Small World, Pantera, Mad Love, Raisin. Normal the Raisin, I'm gonna use the Imperm to negate that. Uh, I'm also going to, after this resolves, throw out a Max C to either decentivize them from making the rock, or if nothing else, getting a draw off of it, right? They decide not to make it, which is also fine with me. Setting a card and then passing back to me. A Jail Goose and Jail Ring is not at all a good top deck, but I can still potentially make plays, except for the Ash Blossom hitting the Heritage here. 
Well, not for this Ash Blossom, I could have added, you know, one of my Infernoble Knights. Probably Oliver, because we don't particularly need it for any part of the combo line. Or, I guess, Augier to start our combo line. Either way, I would have added one of those and then equipped it with All Mace and just sent that for the original Sin for uh, Fire Flint Lady or Ricardetto and then just gone into my combo line. But, with Ash Blossom, that's going to definitely change things. But we're not totally out of place here. What I can do is I can equip All Mace to my opponent's monster, then use the original Sin, sending the All Mace to summon out Renaud. Now I can use Renaud's effect to bring back the All Mace, equip All Mace to Renaud, then I can use All Mace's effect to send it and add Durandel, equip Durandel to Renaud, use Durandel to add Fire Flint Lady, special, and then Link Summon into Isol. That's my plan here. And again, it's, it's wild. If you're willing to, like... It, rather, uh, willing is the wrong word. Um, if you look outside of the combo lines, there are so many ways to establish plays with this deck, even with hands like this that look totally just dead, completely dead. All right, so there's the Durandel, and they had a Dust Devil. <laughs> yeah, it really came down to Dust Devil being their last card. Um, well, I guess Zhao Long was their last card, but yeah, it's 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 pretty Jover at this point. Um, but I did want to show off, if nothing else, uh, how to make at least some amount of plays through, uh, your opponent's disruption, also going second, also not having a good opening hand. Um, uh, again, this hand was really, really close to comboing off anyway, uh, despite everything my opponent did, but, again, that last card being Dust Devil, unfortunately, was enough to do it. Now my opponent's just getting an insane amount of advantage. And the problem here is that even if I do top deck the Neo Space Connector, it's still gonna be really hard to make plays, which I think I actually do now that I think about it. Well, let's see what happens here. Yeah, because I know they don't kill me this turn. We know they have a Raisin, and I, do we actually know their last card? I'm trying to think. Anyway, we actually rip Wanted here, so I'm gonna Wanted for Diabelle. Diabelle, send me uh, Angel. Well, I'm gonna draw first, actually, because I do have the original Sin in my yard. Okay, summoning Aqua Dolphin, Diabel F to summon, and then Diabel F to place the original Sin, of course. Activating the Sin, oh yeah, because, yeah, we need Aqua Dolphin on the field because it's a warrior. So, but yeah, they can always just summon the Raisin uh, next to my other, like, my EMZ, and it's like, okay, well now I'm just screwed. <laughs> like, you know, I just can't make plays. I think I did actually just play a bunch of cards in vain here. My opponent could have Raisin to the Ice Soul to just ended my misery, but... I think they were smart enough to know that I actually didn't have really have plays here. Yeah, I'm throwing this in fast forward because I'm I'm I don't have a level four in the graveyard. That's the problem, so I can't actually go for Angelica here. I can Durandal for the Oliver, but I can't normal summon Oliver. And then yeah, I just conceded when I realized I couldn't do anything anymore. Ah, I could even go for the access code one because I was a uh, warrior locked at some point. I think it was warrior locked in there, but. Yeah, um, but I mean, you know, again, while that hand uh, not only didn't look very good to begin with, but also got disrupted, again, it was actually so unbelievably close to making plays anyway. It really came down to my opponent's set card being uh, the Dust Devil there. But that'll do it for this video and these games. Hope you all enjoyed uh, this updated Infernoble Knight build. Uh, I really like how streamlined, streamlined this one is, and I can say that... After playing this build, I feel a lot more comfortable uh, just picking this deck up and just messing around with it in general. It's cool and fun. I like it a lot. Uh, but yeah, that'll do it. Let us now move to the outro. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video. That means a lot to me. Uh, it's also a great way to support the channel, so thank you very much for in that way as well. Uh, if you're interested in supporting the channel in other ways, uh, like the very special patrons that I am thanking here, uh, you can do so by checking out some of the links in the description. One of those goes to the Patreon, uh, where you can join these fine folk and support the channel that way. I do post daily content over on Patreon, so uh, you do get something for support there and if you're interested I also have a coaching tier option uh, as well details again will be on patreon in the link below uh, also in the description linked below is my twitch page where I stream uh, a few times a week you can go ahead and check that out follow or subscribe over there uh, if you ever want to catch me live uh, you'll also find my second YouTube channel if you feel like subscribing over there to watch some of the twitch vods as well as some additional uh, non-yu-gi-oh related content that I make over there. Uh, again, 
any of those links you want to check out is all a great way uh, of supporting. But again, even if you don't do that, just watching was also a fantastic way to support. And once again, I have to thank you so very much. But uh, in any case, this is Hexlex. I'm going to be signing out, and I'm hoping you have a fantastic day.